I always say, don't clap, just throw money. <laughs> but I enjoyed the clapping, it was very warm. I'd like to have you focus this morning on a specific text of scripture. Will you turn to Romans chapter 1, and I'm going to read just two verses, verses 24 and especially verse 25 that I want you to keep your finger in as I give this lecture. Listen to God's inspired word. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for, actually the Greek text is the lie, not a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. I've been asked to give you a lecture to get the conference going entitled Oneism or Twoism, Neo-Paganism in the Church. You may know something about Neo-Paganism, but what the heck is Oneism and Twoism? Well, I see those two notions worked out in verse 25 of Romans 1. Oneism, I just gave these titles because it simplifies the way we speak. And actually, instead of telling your non-Christian friends that they're pagans, you can tell them that they're oneists and they're not offended. Because <laughs> they don't know what you mean by that, and maybe you don't know what you mean by that. But anyway, oneism, and Paul amazingly develops these two fundamental notions in this verse. That's a sign of his genius that he can say things in a very short span that include absolutely everything. And here Paul is actually saying that there are only two worldviews. Did you notice that? Only two possibilities for existence in this world. You either worship creation in a thousand different forms, or you worship the creator. Now I call that worship of creation oneism because the worship of creation means that you have granted to matter ultimate significance. Matter is self-creating and thus is worship, worthy of worship. And of course you can include yourself in that because you're part, part of matter, you're part of nature. And that's the classic form of paganism. It's the worship of nature. So Paul tells us that's one way of being a human being. The other way is worshiping God who is separate from the creation, as the creator. I call that twoism because in that particular case, there's not just one form of existence, which includes everything, and thus making distinctions doesn't make any sense because everything is fundamentally divine and the same. On the other hand, there are two kinds of existence in the whole of reality the existence of God, the creator, who is distinct from the creation, and the creation itself, in which you and I find ourselves. So that's two kinds of existence. I call that twoism. It's fundamental, is it not, to a biblical and reformed worldview. You remember how the Bible begins, and it's a programmatic statement. It's the gospel that Moses took to the pagans of Canaan and Egypt. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's twoism. That's the fundamental ground zero of all our theology. And for many years, indeed centuries, the West was based upon that fundamental notion of twoism. Not everyone really understood what it meant, and some rejected it, but we thought of existence under the canopy of tourism. We now find ourselves in a culture that has ripped away that notion of God separate from us, and we functioning in some relationship to that kind of a God, and have adopted a oneist view of existence. So I want you to be 
helped with this term as you wander around in your world, that the people you are meeting are becoming more and more oneist. I'm amazed as I look over my life at the changes that have happened in Western culture, and in particular, in uh, American culture. I came here in 64 on a different plane from the Beatles, but uh, <laughs> some of you know that I actually grew up and, and played music with John Lennon. So I should have been playing last night, by the way. Uh, <laughs> be that as it may, the Beatles went east and they became Hindus and they brought all that stuff back to the West. But when I came in 64, I saw a culture that was incredibly Christian and I'd never seen anything like it. How different the culture is today. Why are barbaric Dionysian sex orgies normal fare for university students today? The sex week at Northwestern University will feature a Chicago-based dominatrix named Lady Sophia, who will teach the students various forms of BDSM, bondage, discipline, and sadomasochism. That's part of the education that our young people are getting today. Even in a so-called Christian college like uh, Oberlin, who for 35 years had a sex, safer sex night that some have described, some in the school have described as lascivious debauchery. And they want to clean it up a little bit now. On that level, our culture has radically changed. Just look at the films of uh, spring break down in Florida, where uh, the next generation of our intellectuals are developing their thinking, <clears throat> certain kinds of thinking anyway. If a picture's worth a thousand words, the picture in the Huffington Post a few months ago to me said it all. A picture of 20 policemen in dress uniform sitting on prayer stools in a Buddhist temple. In deep meditative mode, these were officers of the Ontario Region Police Force in Canada, seeking the wisdom of Buddhism. You wonder how these particular police officers will join the Western binary right and wrong laws of the West with uh, non-binary principles of Buddhist spirituality. How will they give out parking tickets? Maybe marked guilty, but not guilty. <laughs> Sounds like France, but anyway. Uh, but here you have it. Those two pictures of sexuality and spirituality tells you a lot about where our culture is today. And of course, we're the way we are today because as I came to the States in 64, what was happening was the 60s revolution. And uh, it was a revolution that was called the sexual revolution, but it was also called the spiritual revolution. So you had that joining of sexuality and spirituality in the 60s uh, cultural revolution. In terms of uh, spirituality, it's amazing to see what has happened to our Western once, quote, Christian, unquote, culture. There are two books that I recommend to you. Colin Campbell, The Easternization of the West, argues that a plausible case can be made for the claim that there is a process of Easternization currently occurring in the West quite unlike anything previously experienced. In other words, Eastern thinking, in particular Hinduism and Buddhism, has been transported over to the West, and that kind of thinking was never known until a few years ago in the West, 
and it's transforming the way people think. Another book by Philip Goldberg entitled American Veda, Veda is Indian philosophy, and he stated in 2010, large numbers of Americans have arrived at a worldview of Hinduism, a reconfiguration comparable, oh, this is interesting, comparable in power in our culture to the great awakenings, Christian great awakenings of the 18th century. That's where this man, a uh, sociologist, places the, uh, the effect of this turn to the East. Very simply, this man points out that the essence of Hinduism is expressed in a term that is Sanskrit, the term Advaita, A-D-V-A-I-T-A. And uh, I was discovering this that I'd just written a book entitled One or Two. Can, what is it? What's the, sep, I can't remember the second subtitle of my book. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, Discovering a World of Difference. When you write a number of books, they all blend into one. In fact, they all say the same thing with just different titles. So. <laughs> anyway, I was writing the book, uh, one or two, and I discovered this man's book and this Sanskrit term, Advaita. And to my surprise, Advaita in Sanskrit means not two. That is interesting. That means that the worldview that is taking over the West is a destruction of twoism and an embracing of oneism. And this is about as revolutionary as we can get. You can actually see another use of the term, and you probably are beginning to see it now in news reports of various kinds, the term non-binary. Non-binary means not two which is essentially what the Christian gospel is all about. The Christian gospel is about two. God the creator who redeems the creation. That's two. This non-binary approach to life today is taking over our culture. Here's an example. Dartmouth's website for incoming students says, Dartmouth seeks to provide a living environment welcoming to all gender identities, one not limited by the traditional gender binary. Keep your ear open for this rejection of the binary. That's what's fundamentally transforming our culture today. So, uh, in spirituality and in particular, in sexuality, we are seeing a transformation of the culture. And the title of my lecture that I was asked to give was Neo-Paganism in the Church. But if there's Neo-Paganism in the Church, it's because Neo-Paganism has become fundamental as an operating tool in the culture. And so many Christians turn to our culture for wisdom without understanding what has been happening in our culture in the last 60 years or so. It's been a radical transformation of what once was a culture that did sort of appeal to certain biblical notions to reject the whole thing as uh, binary and not worthy of attention. This is where we are. But it is especially expressed in the whole issue of homosexuality. And I want to focus on this because this, to my way of thinking, is where paganism is making a massive entrance into the churches. And I want to show you the essence of this, uh, the essence of this uh, expression of sexuality uh, from a spiritual perspective. I turn to a very bright man, 
J. Michael Clark, a professor at Emory University, who a number of years ago came out as a gay man. He was raised as a Christian in the South. But this is what he said about being gay. Being a gay man or lesbian entails far more than sexual behavior alone. It entails a whole mode of being in the world. And he actually says that the problem is not mean-spirited or hateful Christians. Rather, the problem lies with the whole biblical worldview and theological paradigm. He could not make his ways of thinking and acting fit with the Bible. And so, honestly, he turned away from Scripture and turned and looked for a sexual model in the American Indian tradition, in the uh, shaman known as the Bedachi. So this man began to develop his way of thinking on the worldview that he saw as implicit in this kind of sexual expression. Now, we don't hear much about that. We hear that homosexuality is a part of Western civil and human rights and really should be met with Christian acceptance and love. But as the West turns more and more spiritually to paganism, Eastern thinking, we find more and more it's turning to a sort of pagan sexual option as well. Just so that you will be aware of how pagan we can get as a culture, during the 90s, I was following a very spiritual woman by the name of Jean Houston, who was the spiritual advisor to then First Lady Hillary Clinton in the White House, helping her make a spiritual connection with Eleanor Roosevelt. The media had various ways of describing this, two very bright and intelligent women thinking about her, but actually she was a ch she is a spiritual channel, getting in touch with the spirit of Eleanor Roosevelt. And the proof is that she said at that particular moment, we are living in a state of both breakdown and breakthrough, a whole system transition requiring a new alignment that only myth can bring. And the myth that she proposed was a book that she published in that same year of 1995, The Passion of Isis and Osiris the goddess of the underworld, so well known in Egypt at the time of Moses. So we see that going through our culture, sometimes at the very highest levels, is this commitment to pagan mythology and practice. And I want to help you to see that the fundamental expressions of oneism and twoism are being expressed through these two areas of spirituality and sexuality. And without a robust view of scripture or an understanding of the being of God, how can the church avoid falling into the trap of believing that the church must open its arms and normalize this kind of expression. An evangelical by the name of Ken Wilson, in a very influential book entitled A Letter to My Congregation, 2014, which I've read very carefully, says this, we are all male and female part of the bride of Christ. He believes that we should integrate now homosexuals into the church, both in membership and in ministry. But his book is read by many evangelicals. And here's what he says, maybe we are being asked to relax around gender distinctions a little. Who is asking him? <laughs> 
Well, obviously, it's the culture to which he's turning to relax around gender distinctions is a programmatic statement opening up this welcoming of all kinds of sexual practice. You see this expressed very clearly in a Roman Catholic mystic who goes around, sometimes in evangelical churches, by the way, by the name of Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R, who interestingly uh, teaches what he calls non-dual spirituality. You see all this play on two and one, non-dual, uh, non-binary, and so on. He teaches non-dual spirituality. That is that we are basically one with God because inside of us there is the divine spirit. But here's what he says. Gay people get non-duality because it is in their DNA. Our gay people, that is people following his spirituality, will often get non-dual consciousness because it is written into their very being somehow. So here you have this man admitting that this spirituality is particularly well expressed in homosexuality. It's interesting to know exactly where you can take this analysis of the ultimate spiritual meaning of homosexual practice. And I'm developing this for you. I'm not being very kind to you because once you know this, you're not going to be able to forget it. And you're going to have to take it seriously if you want to talk about orthodoxy, you may have to say something about this. And we live in a culture where it's very dangerous to talk about this. But uh, I think it's important for us as Christians to understand the heart of the spiritual expression going on, though doubtless many homosexuals have no clue about it, in this particular form of sexuality. But I think that, that uh, J. Michael Clark pointed the way in the 80s that this is where he went and this is where we should all go to understand it. And if you do that, you have one of the clearest testimonies in ancient times of homosexuality. In the 19th century BC, the uh, androgynous priests of the goddess Ishtar in the Sumerian age. And uh, they transformed their masculinity into femininity and functioned as occult shamans. They engendered abhorrence in others, fearful respect, and uh, they sought to transgress binaries. Again, ancient term, but now rejecting the binary 1900 BC. There's nothing new, you see. There's oneism and twoism. And the transgression of the boundaries is precisely the ancient term of destroying the binary or twoism. The uh, religious scholar Mircea Eliade calls the practice of homosexuality in the ancient world ritualized androgenization. Androgyny, you remember, means male and female in one human being. Andros and gune joined together in one. And of course, homosexuals have to be that as they function in a couple. So it's a sort of fancy way of referring to homosexuality to talk about androgyny. But this study and many others that have been done, I read a very thick book of the study of homosexuality and homosexual shamans in South America uh, prior to the coming of the conquistadores. And so many of these tribes, the Aztecs, the Mayans and so on, all had homosexual priests. What's going on here? 
the Mesopotamian homosexual salmons were called Asinus. The Canaanites called them Kedeshim. The Scythians called them Enares. The Scythians. The Syrians called them Gali. Uh, Augustine describes to us in uh, the town of Hippo where he lived uh, sort of a gay parade of these Gali, these homosexual priests that wandered through the city and demanded help and money and so on. And he was shocked by that. That's in the fourth century AD. So there's absolutely nothing new about this. And Mircea, who is a uh, Romanian religious scholar, uh, but was very much in favor of this process of the West into this new form of spirituality himself, states that ultimately the promotion of this kind of thinking is the wish to recover a lost unity. So when you see that, you see you're talking about bringing everything together. You want to get rid of the distinctions, the rightful distinctions, and bring about this lost unity, which he says androgyny expresses. And once you uncover the uh, extent of this kind of spirituality in the ancient pagan world, it makes sense, surely, of what the Old Testament is always saying. In Leviticus, for instance, you shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt or in the land of Canaan. They knew precisely what was going on from a physical and spiritual perspective because they knew that it sought to reject God the Creator for the many gods of paganism. And that's exactly Paul's argumentation in this text of Romans. Once you reject God the Creator, he says in Romans 1.25, for this reason, verse 26, begins off, for this reason, and then he begins to describe homosexuality. See, Paul is giving it this theological interpretation, the rejection of God the Creator. I can't go deeply into this. It is a massive field of study, by the way, but I just want you to know that it's all out there and it's all very clear and the goal of why it was being done. So throughout time and space, time, history, space, all across the globe, you have the same phenomenon. But there's no evidence of any direct contact, which must mean that there's something inherent about the practice that produces the kind of spirituality that is also practiced. This is very impressive material to me, that we are not dealing with civil rights or human rights. We're dealing with an ideology that wants to get rid of the God of the Bible. And it will. And it will do so in churches as well. All those churches that impose this kind of thinking in the name of love and acceptance into a truest community of believers will destroy those communities when this kind of thinking becomes obvious and when it is able to take on the spiritual implications. Just one more example, a more recent one is... Uh, to be found in June Singer in her book, Androgyny Towards a New Sexuality. This was published in 1977, so right at the end, sort of, of the 60s revolution. She's a Jungian psychologist and a Gnostic, ex-Jew, a friend of Carl Jung, and her book, Androgyny Towards a New Sexuality, is trying to show what's actually going on in the 60s revolution. And again, I'm not sure we've seen much about this, but I'm more and more convinced that this is the essence of what was happening. 
she says, what lies in store as we move towards the longed-for conjunction of the opposites? Ah, in other words, the rejection of twoism. Can the human psyche realize its own creative potential through building its own cosmology? Here we have it. This movement is committed to constructing a, a thoroughgoing intellectual worldview, a cosmology, based on what? Simply the practice of homosexuality? No. Based on its ultimate spiritual meaning. And that will transform the West, she says. She's calling for a coherent, all-encompassing, attractive, religious, pagan account or cosmology. And this was the killer for me. I, I, I'm glad I didn't make this up, but you still think that I made it up when I read it to you. She says, the archetype of androgyny or homosexuality appears in us as an innate sense of and witness to the primordial cosmic unity. That is, it is the sacrament of oneism. The sacrament. Now, she, she didn't use my term oneism. She used the term monism. But it's exactly the same thing. The sacrament of monism. You see, we are dealing here with a deep sense of spirituality. And it's the destruction of any distinction between God and the world seeking for this unity of all things in the oneness of pagan spirituality. Well, that's the uh, conflict of uh, the church today. Since you stole so much of my time uh, in singing... Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not able to really give you quite a bit of my lecture, but, and I fail to remember that I only had 45 minutes anyway, so I prepared a much longer lecture. But I was uh, recently with a, a scholar, Paul Kengor, who teaches at Grove City College. He's a Roman Catholic, but he studied um, Marxism very deeply. And... Uh, in his book, Takedown, about marriage, he says, this is the only time that the majority of everyday Americans have agreed with communists in one of their sharp, atheistic stances against marriage and the family. It is a breathtaking development to behold. Both sides, that is, communists and everyday Americans, recognize that organized religion and traditional biblical and natural law arguments have no merit, an American majority no longer holds fast to the traditional religious boundaries that navigated the lives of their ancestors. This expert in Marxism, showing how Marxism was committed to the destruction of the family, now sees with the decision uh, of the Supreme Court that so-called capitalist America has joined with Marxism in the destruction of one of the fundamental structures of existence. That's the kind of world in which we live. And I was going to uh, give you some examples of how Christians, sometimes calling themselves evangelicals, are uh, wandering into this field with total ignorance, motivated only by this notion of accepting everybody, of bringing everybody in, including homosexuals, uh, into the church. And uh, I have examples here that I cannot give you of uh, people who cite Jesus and what Jesus would have done. He would have included everybody, and so, so should we. Uh, some, well, I'll give you just one example. Glennon Doyle Melton, who was a massive blogger, 
claims that Jesus led her to divorce her husband and marry international female soccer star Abby Wambach. She says, I know my Jesus, I love him, and I think if he needed to, me to believe that homosexuality was a sin, he would have mentioned it. Of course, Jesus also talked about divorce, right? <laughs> In the same section. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this Ken Wilson makes an appeal to the spirit. And it's interesting, his appeal is really to Jesuit spirituality, uh, or otherwise known as Ignatian spirituality. He calls himself an evangelical, though. But he has this uh, experience with Jesus that confirmed to him that he was pleasing God and walking faithfully with Jesus by publicly defending the rights of gays. Uh, these kinds of people, uh, well, I should give you more examples of love, but you've heard them all. We must love everybody. Uh, a Fuller professor says, what if God judges more by willingness to love than on getting it right on any issue? One concerning use of this term love is by Nicholas Walterstorff a leading reformed philosopher and professor of philosophical theology at Yale. When those with homosexual orientation act on their desires in a loving, committed relationship, they're not, as far as I can see, violating the love command. So at the highest level of certain expressions of reformed theology, we're seeing this appeal to love. But more than that, these same people appeal to the culture as the source of truth. Wilson says he decided on this because so many young people accept gayness and are abandoning the church. So he puts his faith in millennials, 66% of, of whom prefer Buddhism. So can you trust them anyway? He also puts his faith in intelligent, secular, progressive people in Ann Arbor where he has a church. So, you see, the decision to include is fundamentally based on non-biblical, non-Tuist notions. And I have a whole second part of my lecture on uh, Tuism and how we must respond to this. And I see I have five more minutes, so... I will give you the rest of my lecture in five minutes. Yeah, 20 more minutes. Oh, really? Yeah, it's all yours. Did I misread it? No, 20 more minutes. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, let it rip. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I have a little more time because uh, I obviously come to the part that really should interest us as uh, biblical men, biblical thinkers, as well as faithful to Scripture. I could do a study of the biblical text on this issue, but not now. And I do want to recommend a book that recently came out, a 400-page analysis of Jewish and Christian texts, which showed that for over thousands of years, not once is homosexuality accepted either in Judaism or Christianity. It's the book by Fortson and Graham's Unchanging Witness, the Consistent Christian Teaching on Homosexuality in Scripture and Tradition. Broadman Holman, 2016. The, yeah, uh, Fortson and Graham's, G-R-A-M-S, unchanging witness. That's probably all you need. Uh, but it is a brilliant study of all the text and shows not one example appears to defend this position that now evangelicals are falling into by the hundreds of thousands. This is why I wanted to focus, Doug, when you asked me to speak up about paganism in the church that it's coming actually in as much 
by a, uh, an ignorance of what's happening sexually as it is in any kind of theological rejection. It's much more subtle, you see. It makes an appeal to people's emotions. We all want to be loving people. and So that takes me to the second part of my lecture. <laughs> How do we love? And I think we have to develop a love on the basis of twoism. On the basis of who God is, separate from us, and how we are to love that God before we can ever know how we can love other people. So the second part of the failure of Christianity today is not simply that it is overly emotional, but that it does not have a doctrine of God, which is absolutely essential to whatever we do. And if you go to Jesus, as many people did, to ask him what's the essence of things, he cites Mark in Mark 12, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. The second is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, of course, that first part is known as the Shema. It's the great confession of Israel. It was the daily prayer prayed for thousands of years. Jesus went back to the heart of Old Testament piety to emphasize what it means to love God, to love God first. And it seems to me that we have to construct our understanding of the love of God on the basis of twoism, that God is utterly distinct from us and therefore requires a kind of love and respect that we're not used to giving, but is absolutely essential for anything that we do. We love God because he's first. This is good news, because everything starts with a personal God, not with an impersonal nothingness. And Moses tells us that the Lord is abounding in steadfast love. So we love God because he's first, knowing that he precedes us as our loving creator. Long before there were any neighbors to love, God was expressing perfect love because the scriptures say God is love. The prophet Malachi declares, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? And God reveals himself as a caring father. It's interesting, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah compares the spirituality of the Bible to paganism. He says, those who deny the creator are forced to say to a tree, you are my father. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> if you begin there, you've got to get all the love you want from a tree. Or to a stone you gave me birth. Compare that with Psalm 89, 26. You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. So we have, as the first principle, a personal God who was the essence of love. God did not need to create. The reason he created was to share the goodness of existence with us. We love God also because he is Trinity. I wonder how many evangelicals understand the doctrine of the Trinity today. They really need to read the ancient Athanasian Creed that states, whoever will be saved must hold the faith of the universal church that worship one God in Trinity. It's interesting that both rabbinic Judaism and Islam reject the Trinity as a major heresy. But you would almost think that many evangelicals are doing the same thing, at least by ignoring it. But you see, the doctrine of the Trinity, God as Trinity, is absolutely essential. Because 
we find in the Trinity the very source of love by which we can love anything or anybody. The origin of love is not God loving us, but God loving the other members of the Trinity. Thus God can be both personal and transcendent. Not de- when I say trans- not dependent on the creation, which would be a totally oneist kind of God, which you have actually in Islam. God is dependent upon the creation. So ultimately, it's a oneist system. So we have a God who is Trinity, is the source of love and personhood before we ever begin to do anything. And so we love God because he's first and he's Trinity. And then we must love God by honoring how God created the world as a to a structure, in particular, how he created human beings. And uh, I'd just like to suggest that we have in Genesis 2.24, which is the institution of marriage, an incredibly powerful statement about the being of God as Trinity. You see that? I'll try to prove it in a minute, but Genesis 2.24, uh, where it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold on to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It seems to me that we find there something of the Trinity. And so heterosexuality and beyond that heterosexual marriage is a witness to the person of God himself. Because don't we read in 128... God created man in his own image, male and female, in his own image, male and female. So, how can we suggest that the marital bond is a fundamental expression of the Trinity? Well, I think we have in 1 Corinthians 11.3 a biblical inspired statement to prove it where the Apostle Paul says that um, God the Father is the head of Christ as a husband is head of the wife. In other words, that structure of male-female relationship is expressing an ultimate Trinitarian notion of the relation of God between the Father and the Son. And so you really have here, it seems to me, a a biblical expression of marriage being a form of witness to the being of God himself. Do you follow that? I had to go over it quickly. But but then this text uh, uh, where Paul is dealing with this in Ephesians 5, 31 to 32 tells us something, not only about God as Trinity, but God as Redeemer. And so the the gospel becomes involved as well. Paul says, when he cites this text, that it is expressing a mystery. Right? Remember? Paul's call is to reveal the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. In other words, Paul is telling us that his calling as an apostle is to reveal to the churches the spirit-inspired understanding he has of God the Creator, who turns out to be the Redeemer. But the mystery is found in Genesis 2.24, that God, in creating marriage, is revealing himself as the lover of the other, namely the creation. And it's expressed very clearly in Christ's love for the church. Christ, the eternal Son, and his love for the church. So the mystery of the gospel 
is also involved in Genesis 2.24, revealing the mystery of who God is and why he created marriage to begin with. Christians, I believe, must affirm this part of the biblical truth if they want to be faithful in their calling. Because, you remember in Romans 1, Paul teaches what can be known about God is plain to the outsiders. Having been clearly perceived in the things that have been made, Touristically, including sexuality. So it seems to me that part of our witness in proclaiming who God is in the creation is the affirmation of the goodness of the image of God placed in human beings in that heterosexual form. So heterosexual, the heterosexual mandate is not hateful bigotry, The principle of the binary and the mystery revealed in marriage is the vital cosmological concept without which there is no future civilization. We're done. If we give give up on this, we're over. That's the whole meaning of Genesis 2.18. God did want... God didn't want Adam to be alone. God wasn't worried about Adam feeling lonely. He was worried about Adam making babies. That's why he created Eve, who became the mother of a living. And that's why you and I are here today. We have a message, you see, which is both cosmological in the notion of how the creation is put together and also is evangelical in its account of who God is as the great Redeemer. The unique message given to the church that we offer to a lost world is that we love our neighbor by passionately preaching the great cosmic love story of the Creator, totally different from us, but in unbelievable condescension, dying on the cross for the sins of his creation. There is no greater love than this. Last year, we were all celebrating the Reformation, and and I couldn't resist from not citing one of the verses of Luther's Ein Festerbeer. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, His kingdom is forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word and we ask you for the power to be able to defend it and to speak it forth in a very inhospitable time, but a time over which you rule. Will you give strength to us, to these brothers of mine, as they engage in the world? Give them confidence and power of the Spirit to speak your name and to declare your glories in the creation in the way you have structured life and the way you come and you redeem us in Jesus. We pray this for the glory of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.